Dr. Ahlu Alia's life is a saga of great accomplishments. His reputation as a world economist and a dwayne of international finance grew exponentially during his outstanding years at the World Bank, which nurtured his growing skills and understanding of the planning process to set India on the path of sustainable progress. He is an alumnus of Delhi University and received his bachelor's degree from University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. While at Oxford, he was a successful president of the prestigious Oxford Union. He is a visionary, thinker, planner and a prolific writer. During his glittering career, he has had great success in pioneering important reforms that have had a lasting and fruitful impact on the economic canvas of India. A multifaceted, charismatic personality, Dr. Ahluwalia has truly great achievements in a wide variety of fields including economics, international finance, governance, plans and policies, arts, education and world affairs. He is a living example of these rare qualities through which he has contributed significantly to the economic revolution in India. Amity University, with utmost respect and pride, is privileged to honor Dr. Montek Singh Ahluwalia with Honoris Causa Doctorate of Philosophy D. Phil for his commendable vision for India's sustainable economic growth and for prosperity for the enormous efforts he has made to crystallize these plans and policies. I request Honorable Founder President and Chancellor Sir to please confer upon Dr. Montek Singh Ahluwalia the degree of Doctor of Philosophy D. Phil Honoris Causa. Founder President of Amity University, Uttar Pradesh, Sri Chauhanji, Chairperson, Chancellor, Visitor, Vice Chancellor, other distinguished members on this day, students, parents, members of the faculty. I'm greatly honored by being conferred this honorary degree, and even more so by the very kind words that. Uh, Chohanji has just said about me. You know, in public life I always feel there are many occasions when you get criticized and you don't deserve it, uh, but then there are others when you get praised and you don't actually deserve it either, but it sort of balances out. So in that spirit, I thank you, sir, for everything you've said. You know, a convocation address puts a huge burden on the person giving the address. The reason is that it is the last piece of mandatory instruction that is given to graduates before they get their degrees. And this in one sense from my point of view is a huge responsibility because I know you work so hard, you know, about to give a degree uh, and then the only thing is you have to listen to the convocation address. But you know, when I was a young person, I sort of accepted that because I said, well, we have to be there, but we don't actually have to listen, and hopefully it won't be very long. Now, for the reasons that uh, Ashokji has already mentioned, since I have an unavoidable uh, appointment to keep in Delhi, um, this is not going to be very long. Actually, it's going to be shorter than is necessary for me to leave at 12.30, but I do want to extend my apology uh, to all the graduating students uh, for the fact that I'm being permitted by the founder president and the chancellor and the visitor uh, to accept a degree, uh, make some remarks and then leave, which is actually not the right thing to do. 
so I would personally like to extend right at the beginning my congratulations to all the students who are going to get degrees today, including especially to those who are going to get awards. I, I particularly want to also uh, extend my congratulations to those parents who are here today. Actually, you know, for parents, the convocation is a much more important thing for parents because they actually remember it for a long time. Graduating students will go on to many exciting things and this is only a passing moment. So for the parents who have sent their children to this university, I do extend my warm, uh, warm congratulations. I would also like to congratulate uh, the founding president, his family, and the wonderful team that he has put together to run this university. Uh, I've read the report that was sent to me. I've spoken to many people who have visited the university. I've spoken to some friends whose children have graduated from the university and that is actually the most important thing. Uh, because when they say they, they think it was a really good experience, that is a huge compliment to the university, to the staff and everybody else. And of course, I read, listened to the report of the Vice Chancellor, which lists many things that the university has done, uh, and rather its students have done, uh, patents obtained, competitive work, etc., etc., all of which suggests that this is truly a vibrant university and a contribution uh, to building infrastructure in a very important part of India uh, for the future. Uh, we in the Planning Commission are very aware that our future economic prospects at the moment look very good. Uh, but for this to continue and for the true potential of India to be realized, it is extremely important that the scale of our higher education should expand. Now, higher education is only the top of the pyramid, so actually we are looking at the whole educational spectrum. Schools and primary schools, secondary schools. Actually, I would encourage uh, Chohanji that there's no harm in getting in to do some of that also because really we need action in all fronts. But you know, in the universities uh, at the moment, about 11% of each cohort goes through university education. Uh, and this was roughly similar to China about 10 years ago. And China has managed within 10 years to expand from 10% to 20%. Uh, we also want a similar expansion. It will probably take more than 10 years in our case. But we do want something by, say, 2020 that at least, and hopefully a little more, than 20% of our students of each cohort should actually end up getting some kind of higher education. You know, to put this in perspective, in the developed world, the percentage is as high as 45%. And there are many developing countries which are somewhere between 20 and 40. Uh, and you know, everybody knows how difficult it is to expand universities or create universities. <coughs> and to do that in a 10-year period is not a small task. We will have to see a very substantial expansion in the public sector universities, which is being planned. But in our view, we will not achieve the end result unless there is a parallel complementary expansion in private sector universities also. That is the policy of the Government of India. Many states also are very encouraging, trying to get private initiative into universities. And clearly, Amity University is a living proof that it is possible to set up a good quality university to attract students and to give them superior education. So I think in that respect, your university is a pioneer. Uh, you are all pioneers. 
and certainly those who founded the university and in many ways even more important those who are actually conducting the teaching of the university have every reason to be very satisfied with what they are doing and the country has every reason to thank them for it and we hope that you will do more and you will open more universities and that other people will actually follow in your footsteps. Um, I, I think one of the things about coming back to the idea of giving a convocation address I'm very aware that those of you who are wearing academic gowns, you have worked very hard for the degrees that you have earned. That's one important difference between the real graduates and the honorary graduates. The honorary graduates just pick it up out of affection uh, from the academic council, but I know you have worked very hard. And it would be nice to think that, right, the hard work is over, and now we just coast along, get a job, have fun. Of course, uh, uh, I'm sure you know that. I'm sure the university has told you that. You know, this, this is not a graduation uh, ceremony. Is not, it's the end of one process, but actually it's the beginning of another. And very different kinds of effort will be required. Uh, but the fact is, uh, if India is going to succeed, then actually your hard work has just begun. Uh, those of you that go into higher education, further education, uh, will be basically getting beyond uh, the stage where you are following set courses and into the stage where you are doing research, which is inevitably uh, much more driven by issues of quality. Those of you who go into the labor force will actually experience both the trials and also, I think, the excitement uh, of what is going on in a country that is changing very rapidly. And actually I want to basically spend a few minutes sharing with you an economist's perception of the nature of those changes. I know that everybody graduating today is actually an engineer or a scientist. That, by the way, is a very important part of what is going to make us go move, move forward. But the key point I want to make is that whenever I attend a convocation, I'm obviously reminded of the convocation where I myself earned a degree in Delhi University way back in 1963. And you know, at that time, the economy was growing at about 3.5% per year and continued to do that for the next 15, 16 years. And you know, when an economy grows at 3.5% in terms of GDP, but the population growth is over 2%, which it was at that time, then per capita income in such an economy is actually growing at less than 1.5%. When per capita income grows at 1.5%, it takes 45 years for per capita income to double. And I think the doubling of per capita income is very important. It's much more important than the doubling of total GDP. It's very easy to imagine a situation where our GDP becomes twice what it is, but the per capita income is the same. That's not an economy which has changed. That's just an economy that has expanded. Change occurs when per capita income changes. Tastes change, people demand different things, the structure of production changes. Otherwise, you, you don't have an India that's twice as rich, you just have an India that's twice as large. So you have two Indias. That's not interesting. But when per capita income changes, structure changes. And as I said, that when I graduated in 1963, it took 45 years for per capita income to double. So whatever the changes are that are associated with a doubling of per capita income, Took, over, took place over 45 years. You are graduating at a time when the economy is now growing. For the last 10 years, the average growth of the economy has been 7.7%. In other words, more than twice what was happening then. But more importantly, the underlying growth potential of this economy is much more than 7.7%. Before the economic crisis hit the world in 2008, 
the Indian economy over a four-year period grew at an average rate of 9%. Then it declined to about 6.7 during the crisis year, picked up again to 7.4 in 2009-2010. This year we had targeted 8.5. It probably will do a little more than that. And next year we're back to 9. And our current task given to us by the Prime Minister in the Planning Commission is to see whether during the 12th plan period, which begins in the year 2012, whether we can get to a GDP growth rate of 9 or 10 percent. Now even if we don't hit 10 percent and we manage to keep 9, which actually we have achieved before, since per cap population growth is now probably going to be less than 1.5 percent, per capita income will grow at more than 7.5 percent or so. Now what does this mean? When per capita income grows at 7.5 percent, then per capita income doubles in nine years. So whereas it took 45 years for my generation to see a doubling in per capita income, it's going to take nine years for your generation to see a doubling in per capita income. And if that were to continue, then it is easy to see that it will double in nine years, it will quadruple in 18 years, and it will increase eightfold in 27 years. So by the time you are in what would normally be called uh, the prime of working life, you become senior people, running companies, etc., you're going to be running companies in a country that will be at least eight times richer per capita than it is today. This is actually an, a huge change and the most important thing is that you have to cope with this change much faster than we have to cope with this change. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that the products that are going to be demanded probably can't even be imagined today. The technologies that will be in use can't be imagined today. And therefore I would really urge you that as you move forward, of course the, hard, the skills that you have learned at this university and the values that I'm sure you have been taught, and in many ways by the way the values are, well I would say more important but at least as important as the skills. The truth is that the values don't change. The values will remain the same. The skills will have to change dramatically. I mean, when I left the university, the, the automobile that everybody drove was the ambassador or the Fiat. And 25 years later, it was the same. Today is radically different. You can hardly see uh, these particular automobiles on the road. So I think as you, as you enter your working life, I would, I would say that the only piece of advice that I have to give is you better be aware of the fact that the world is changing much faster for you than it did for your parents. And actually in the short run, since senior people should also be aware of this fact, in a way as young people you have a huge advantage. And that advantage is that when the world changes rapidly and technology changes rapidly, seniority is at a discount and youth is at a premium. Because the experience that you had over the last 30 years actually is not only irrelevant, but may actually be an impediment. And that is why around the world people think that it's only young people who can think out of the box. So. I urge you, you've just acquired the skills necessary to have responsibility and maybe you have 10 years when you'll still be counted as young. After that, there will be a new generation of people who will be working with very different technologies and I think your job should be, rather than to claim the merit of seniority over them, recognize that the world has changed and maybe they know something more than you do. It's actually in many ways a very exciting time. It's also a very challenging time. 
but I think that on the whole, if I had to make a choice, I'd much rather be your age than mine, for more, more reasons than one. But most importantly, I think you, I hope, I hope that you will all share in the excitement of the changing world that you will not only see, but actually as uh, your founder president said, you will have a very important opportunity to influence. So with these words, and once again apologizing for the fact that I have to leave, allow me to thank the university for conferring on me this degree. Thank you, sir, for inviting me on this occasion. Can we have a large round of applause? Let me congratulate you once again and your staff and congratulate the students for this very important day. Thank you. Thank you.